This is WorkLab, a podcast from Microsoft, where we'll hear from leaders and scientists about the surprising research and data that is transforming the way we work. The million dollar question right now is where do we go from here and what does place and space and belonging look like going forward? I'm your host, Elise Hugh. This season, we're focusing on hybrid work. We'll let you in on some of Microsoft's most surprising findings to help companies and individuals create a better future of work. The biggest test for companies yet, more monumental than even last year's sudden move to remote work, will be how to navigate the seismic shift to hybrid work. So we're kicking off this season with a 30,000-foot view from someone who knows the subject very well, Jared Spataro, the leader of Microsoft 365 and Microsoft Teams. Jared, thanks for being here. Let's start in the here and now. What are the key factors that you are considering, especially when thinking through back to the office start dates? Because obviously the ground information is changing almost every day. Just like any organization, we are most concerned about the health and safety of the people that we serve. We start with our employees and then the people that we serve. So that's the first and foremost conversation topic when we're talking about when we'll be headed back to our office space in a more normal way. And Microsoft, of course, isn't alone in that so many companies are saying that employees really want flexibility. A lot of them liked being able to have this remote work option when it all started. And it sounds like Microsoft is really embracing that, but it is quite a paradox, right? This shift to hybrid work. What do you think it'll look like when things settle out? Well, let's start with two different data points that really uh, tell an interesting story. The first is focused on what people want when it comes to this remote type of flexibility that they've had. We found in a study that we did called the Work Trends Index that 73% of people we surveyed, and we surveyed 30,000 people across 31 countries, said that they wanted the flexibility to stick around post-pandemic. So that was, you know, I don't think I would have necessarily predicted that pre-pandemic or during the pandemic. At the same time, 67%, same survey base, 67% of people said that they wanted more in-person time with their colleagues too. So we tend to think of this as what we're now calling the hybrid paradox. People want to be back in person with their colleagues to be able to do more. At the same time, they love the flexibility. I hear people saying, I never have eaten breakfast with my kids before. It's sure nice, you know, to be at home for those little moments. I think we have this great opportunity to work it out together so that the future is really the best of of both worlds. And that is kind of this idea of the great reshuffle, right? Absolutely. You know, the great news about Microsoft is we have this opportunity to bring together data points from all over the place. And LinkedIn, at the same time that we've been studying this here in my part of the business, has also been taking a look at this. They have their their talent network to look at and the data points there. Yeah. They found the same types of things. In addition to just flexibility, there's another dimension that this great reshuffle is all about. And it's the idea that people not only want and value that flexibility, but they're also thinking about where they work, why they work, how they work, if they really feel satisfied with their current employer. We had a data point coming from that survey I mentioned earlier that said 41% of people all around the world, remember this is a very global survey, 31 countries, 41% of people said that within 12 months, they did not expect to be with the same employer. That's what's behind the shuffle. Yeah, we haven't seen numbers like that for decades. And that sets things up for that great reshuffle. How does this great reshuffle and the paradox that you set out, how are these two ideas sort of linked? You have to zoom out, at least as I see the picture right now. The first thing that's happening is that we are absolutely seeing that as people are pushed into remote work, not something anyone would have chosen, that they learn new skills and that they saw benefits from flexibility. You know, so it was like, wait, I could do this and there are real benefits. So that started to enter into, I'd say, the mind of the average worker in a way that it hasn't previously. Remember, pre-pandemic, although people did work remotely, for the most part, it was kind of considered an anomaly. Right, right. Then the second thing that has been fascinating for me is based on the data as I read it, it sure feels like the pandemic has had as big an impact on people's psyches as things like the Great Depression, the World War I, World War II, mm-hmm. these very big events that cause people to rethink what's important to them. You know, where am I spending my time? Why am I spending it there? What should I be doing differently? When you smash those two things together, all of a sudden you end up in this kind of great reshuffle where lots of people are saying, gosh, you know what? Remote work and this new hybrid work is giving me more flexibility. 
And gosh, now that I come to think about it, I want to do something different anyway. And that leads to kind of a real shift in the labor market that, that I think companies are, are just beginning to experience right now. And obviously, data is so important to undergird all of this, and y'all have gathered a lot of it. So let's talk about where the data comes from. There's so many layers of research at Microsoft. So walk us through a few. Well, it's interesting because like a puzzle, we're trying to piece this together. Nobody knows exactly what's going on, and it's very unique because we're all going through it together. Uh, The couple of places that we're able to get clues include what we call the Microsoft Graph. This is essentially telemetry from Microsoft 365, from Teams, from the products that people use every day. Break that down for me. (laughs) For for those of us who are not as technical... (laughs) Well, Teams is a product that is used by um, over 250 million people on a monthly basis. And what that means is, is they fire up Teams and use it. That includes chat, meetings, you know, phone calls. We're able to take all of the telemetry associated with that and then kind of build out a view of communication. We don't do this on a one-on-one basis. It's all aggregated data so we can look at large trends. Yep. We're able to see that during the pandemic in some countries, the workday got longer by more than two hours. In most countries, it was longer by an hour. So we could actually see patterns in how people work to how they communicated with other people. The second place is uh, Microsoft Research. We have some great researchers here on staff, and they really turned their resources, time, and attention to trying to figure out what was going on. And this meant that they were out doing real first simple examples would include strapping these EEG monitors onto people's heads and having them attend video meetings and saying, let's watch the, the beta brain waves. Let's see what happens. You know, it's that type of research, primary research that gets us the cutting edge of what's going on. Is there such a thing as, you know, this digital exhaustion? Does it really exist? Where does it go? And that's the second big one for us. The third one then turns us to uh, customer and third-party research. This is where we work together with educational institutions, where we go deep with customers, where we have the opportunity to dig in and say, let's look at this, not just from a numbers basis, but let's look at a particular scenario and see what's happening. Got it. And I understand that Microsoft is doing daily pulse surveys too. So can you talk a little bit about what those are and when you started them? We have an employee base of over 175,000 employees across the world in 190 countries. So just Mm -hmm. pulsing our own employees gives us a sense for where people are. Um, We ask them all sorts of questions about how they're feeling about their work, how they feel about the environment they work in, how they feel about their manager. And then we try to collect some long form input that they can give us as well. So it's a super rich global data set, you know, that allows us to understand what's going on with our workforce right now. Did anything surprise you? I was surprised as the results started rolling in and then were consistent as to how the what we would call kind of the inclusion index has gone up. And what we mean by that is people now feel more included than they ever have at Microsoft, which is really fascinating. It wasn't something that I necessarily would have predicted previously. Um, And I just think that it's because we're in this new place where people have adapted to being able to meet online. It's a very level playing field. Everybody from the CEO to to the newest intern is online. They kind of have all the same tools at their disposal. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say that notion about the democratization of work because of this moment and the tools that we're using. The culture in any type of organization evolves over time. And, you know, one of the aspects of cultures that people have been there for a long time tend to understand it better or navigate it better. But when we move to remote work, all of a sudden our interactions were being mediated through these tools. If I take Teams as an example, you had video conferencing. Everybody was a a square, if you will. One of the things that we started to see was that we were all adapting to the tools at the same time. And a specific example for us is the integration of chat into meetings became a very important part of what people did. We found that it gave people a voice in a way that they previously may not have had in some meetings. So as an example, I often see in in my own meetings that people who may have been a little bit more reticent to speak up in person for whatever reason Mm -hmm. aren't at all reticent to write something in the chat. And people read that and it can take the the meeting in a totally different direction. It's not uncommon in our meetings for someone to say, hey, Sarah just put some data in the chat that we should really think about, you know, and it would have been hard. You would have had to find a time to insert yourself. Sarah would have had to get in there and show what she was doing. So it's a new modality that I think really is changing communication for the better. Yeah, I imagine it really helps introverts or those who are more introverted among us. 
My sense is that's true. My sense it also, it helps folks who are earlier in career, who are trying to just figure out the dynamics of how do these things work? You know, you, you may remember, you know, what it feels like. And you can think back to like, oh yeah, I remember trying to insert myself into a conversation. Yes. And now you can yes. do that in a different way. And Microsoft has done a ton of research about remote meetings. Let's take a minute to hear from researcher Jamie T. Van, who shared some insights with our correspondent, Mary Melton. Jamie is the chief scientist at Microsoft. She was new to the role when the pandemic hit, which is pretty remarkable. And that means she's been at the center of the largest research effort in Microsoft's history. Thank you, Jamie, so much for being here. Let's start with remote meetings. Tell us what you've learned. Research that we've done using EEG brain scans of how people's brains work actually show that meeting people remotely for the first time is really stressful. You can, when you look at those scans, you can see the cognitive load is greater when you meet somebody remotely than in person. And then perhaps even more importantly, that initial remote meeting impacts our future interactions. So that high cognitive load that you have when you meet somebody for the first time, when they're remote, it persists when you're in person. And it's actually more stressful to see that person if you've met them for the first time remotely in person. And that actually really makes me worried for my twin boys, for example who started high school this year, but didn't meet any of their classmates in person and had to until eight months in. Is there a disconnect that goes on when you see someone in person when you've only experienced them through a screen? Like, I'm wondering if just living in Los Angeles, it's always strange to meet a celebrity who I've only seen on the screen my entire life, and they almost don't look real. So I just, in hearing your explanation of that, I just, I wonder if that's analogous to this at all. Yeah, it's so different to talk to somebody remotely versus in person. One of the things that's been shocking going back into the office is that people are different heights. (laughs) It's kind of funny to be like, oh, I had no idea how tall you were. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, not that I've had any Teams meetings with Brad Pitt, but when I first saw him, I was like, (laughs) oh, he's not as big as I thought he was going to be. So, yeah, I could see how that could work. But then people have sides of their faces and backs and, you know, and, and actually we use a lot of these cues as well of being able to lean into somebody to indicate attention. Actually, one of the things that you find really hard with remote meetings is turn-taking. And there's a number of reasons that turn-taking is hard. Uh, You know, some of them are technological. Turn-taking can be hard because there's lag in the audio or those sorts of things. But a lot of them are actually the fact that when we're meeting with somebody remotely, we lose a ton of cues. You lose seeing a person as a full person, you lose a lot of the common ground, but you also gain a lot of things as well. So one of the things that I love about remote meetings is being able to have my notes right in front of me. I also like being able to see everybody's names. It's actually made it much easier for me to remember who people are. And another thing that we see is people are really using in-meeting chat, the sort of parallel chat that occurs next to a meeting a lot. In fact, 70% of Microsoft employees are using in-meeting chat. One of the advantages of that is it allows people to start participating without having to actively take the floor. And so you see that being used by people with less visibility in a meeting. For example, women find in-meeting chat to be particularly valuable to them. And then there's also a really interesting point there, too, which is as we move to hybrid work, there's a real opportunity for us to start thinking about how to capture the best things that we've learned from remote work and carry those forward into our new ways of working. Jamie, thank you so much for your time and your insights. Your work is fascinating, and I really appreciate you sharing it with us. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Fascinating indeed. Okay, so all of this data help undergird these giant work trend index reports. Talk about the why. What's the motive behind them? First, no one knows right now where it's all going. So we've tried to adopt this idea of being a learn-it-all rather than a know-it-all. That's an important Mm. aspect of Microsoft's culture that I think has served us well over the last few years under Satya Nadella, our CEO. He's really, I think, trained us to say, gosh, it's not the people who think they know what the world looks like or will look like. It's the people who can learn quickly, who can take signal and process that. The second thing is we we actually don't believe that there really is a business of predicting the future as much as there's a business of creating the future. So the underlying why behind it all is, man, I want the best of both worlds. I want the beauty of having those colleagues of mine be able to really eat breakfast with their kids still during the week. At the same time, 
I think we have been missing some in-person interactions and the social capital that comes from those. So I want it all. Sure. I think we can get the best of both worlds, but we have to do that together. We have to do that with culture and technology. It kind of takes, I would say, a very pragmatic approach to building the future, and that's what we're after. Jared, you have said that we are the first truly digital generation of workers on the planet. Has this transition been easier for some generations than others, like younger workers? It's been a mixed bag. We have seen... Younger generations who I would say are more technology literate take more quickly to the technology. Very simple example. Texting already was a very you know, common way to communicate among uh, millennials and folks who are just starting to enter into the workforce now. So texting as a part of a meeting, essentially, you know, the meeting chat wasn't a big deal. They picked up on it quickly. The interesting thing, however, is that as we've gone out to analyze the data and figure out what we see happening there, that it actually has been more when we asked people how they were feeling about their remote experience, this is in that work trends index, yeah. 61% of leaders, and we defined a leader as someone who had decision-making authority for a part of the business, said that they were thriving. That was a full 23 percentage points higher than those without decision-making authority. So already, you know, we had people in the organization wow. who seemed to catch up to the technology over time, and they said, "Well, it's great. I love this. Now, in contrast, 60% of Gen Z said that they were just barely surviving or struggling in this new work environment. And that was a surprise because I would have thought, well, Mm. you're technology literate. And what it ended up as we kind of have dug into it, it's not just about the technology. It's about your ability to use the technology and pull on the networks, the social capital you've built up to know how to get things done. And I just think we didn't realize that when you're you're early in career, you're still Mm -hmm. learning the rules. It has been more difficult for sure, even though the tech is great to learn those ropes. Did you see a generational divide then in how respondents answered the questions about whether they wanted to come back to the office full time or whether they wanted to stay remote or hybrid? We did see that. We actually saw three groups that were much more pulled or attracted to remote jobs. Those were Gen Z, we just talked about, so they felt more comfortable with this idea of let's go remote. Women in general and those without graduate degree those three areas. So what we get excited about there is from our perspective, remote opens new possibilities, not just for those individuals, not just for those groups, but for the economy. This is a great example where it's clear that remote jobs and remote work seems to be very attractive for a certain segment or a couple of segments of of the population. Well, as much as people want the flexibility that you're discussing, there's also a lot of uncertainty in this moment, which makes your job interesting, right? About how all of this is going to work practically, as you've mentioned. So that's a huge question. How are you thinking about creating a sense of place and culture, no matter what the space? This is kind of the the million dollar question right now is where do we go from here? And what does place and space and belonging look like going forward? We believe that every organization is going to need to create a digital employee experience. For decades now, people have spent money creating a physical employee experience. They spend money on everything from carpet to chairs to painting to even art that's on the wall. Yeah. (laughs) We believe that people are going to have to spend that same type of time, attention, and money on a digital experience that has persistence regardless of where you are. So in other words, if I wake up and roll out of bed and walk over to my office and I happen to be working from home that day, I need to be able to feel like I'm a part of the organization that I belong to. I need to feel like I'm in the know. I need to feel like I'm connected. I need to see in many ways, you know, almost that branding and that feel. I know what's going on. It needs to be able to give you those same signals that you got when you walked into your familiar office and you saw your uh, receptionist and you said hello and you walked in and thought today's going to be a good day. So that's that's one thing Mm -hmm. that we think is important is this idea of investing in digital employee experience just to get started. Can you paint a picture of some examples of how a digital experience kind of comes alive for somebody? Yeah, if I make it very practical for a moment, it is the evolution of the internet, but in a very modernized way. So the idea behind the internet was quite good because you were able to publish to your employees like, hey, here's what's going on. The, The thing that didn't work is that you were trying to get people to kind of visit an internet site the way they would visit, you know, the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, like come into this. Yes, yes. There's never enough content there, you know, fresh enough for it to be interesting. 
What we're finding and the way that we have built our idea of this digital employee experience platform is when you build it right into the place that people already spend their time, namely into teams, you don't have to ask them to go spend their time there. You have captured them at the point of interest. And that's exactly what we do. Sorry to quote you back to you again, Jared, but you've also said that in the tech industry, remote work led to a rush for talent. So this seems like a good time to discuss the changing geography of work, the idea that anyone can now work from anywhere. How are you preparing for that? Because as this great reshuffle, this migration continues to happen, we're not done with it, right? I think we're just getting started with this great reshuffle. Well, let me just talk about maybe the defense and the offense, if you will, you know. Okay. What's happening on defense? Certainly, I think in the tech industry, we are seeing competitors target each other's talent. And what has happened that <laughs> has been different than previous attempts is that now everyone feels much more comfortable with remote work. And so a, a competitor can come to one of your prized employees and say, look, you wake up on the same bed tomorrow, your kids go to the same school, you actually roll out and walk to the same office. The only thing that's going to be different is you're going to be looking at different people. And I promise you we're better. Come join us. <laughs> and you know, the ability to not change, to essentially take away the transaction costs of relocation is huge. I'm definitely seeing the manifestation of that within our industry. And you have to play defense there by really taking a step back and saying, okay, what is it that keeps people in my organization? You know, it can't just be one aspect of what I used to think of as the package I offered them. Are they feeling really good about multiple aspects so that they are in a good place here? That would lead me then to the offensive side of things where for the first time ever, I also think that you get to go tap into new talent markets in ways that you haven't been able to do before. So just a simple yeah. example, I have a direct report that we hired during the pandemic here. Uh, we hired her in Atlanta. She told me, you know, when my first conversation with her, look, if you tell me I have to relocate to Seattle, the conversation is kind of done. I'm not that interested. Pre-pandemic, oh, wow. we would have said, you know, we're a very Seattle-centric culture. You'd have to be here. Yeah, and then you would have lost her, too, as a recruit. Exactly right. This time I was able to say, you know what? No, like, you don't have to move at all. Like, you can stay where you are. And our conversation not only continued, but ultimately we were able to convince her to come join us. And it just allows us to tap into new labor markets, new talent pools in a way that we haven't been able to do. We've talked a little bit about this already, this idea that one size doesn't fit all when it comes to hybrid work. What data do you have to support that so far? You know, I love to look at the data and have it make me go, hmm, I'm not sure what's going on. And we had two data points that, that did that for us a couple of months ago that really led to an interesting insight. We looked at um, what we called focused work. This was the idea okay. that you could zero in on something, push everything to the side and get some work done. Among employees who said that they plan to spend more than nine tenths of their time working at the office. So these are the people who said, I want to get back into the office, please. 58% cited focused work as the top reason. Presumably, what they were telling us is, it's a little hard to find my focus at home. And we can understand that. There's a lot going on at home. Meanwhile, among employees who said that they plan to spend nine-tenths of their working time at home, 58%, again, the same share, said that focus work was the reason why. In other words, those employees were telling us, I go into an office and I can't focus. Everybody talks to me. And so what was so interesting about those two data points for me is it just showed this idea that like, hey, different strokes for different folks. We, we essentially have you know, two different working styles here manifesting themselves in a more flexible way by saying, hey, for me, focus happens at home. And someone else saying, but for me, focus happens at the office and I shut my door. And we just think that that's great. We think we should be able to accommodate that flexibility. And for those coming back in, how have you maybe modified or redesigned the offices? Will they look different to an employee who's walking through the door for the first time in, gosh, almost two years? When it comes to safety, we've been looking at local regulations and we follow those things. If we need to spread out desks and create social distancing, we do that. But for the most part, as people have gone back, the offices aren't all that different. They aren't redone or redesigned. One of the big questions that, of course, is, you know, do you need less or more office space and how will that space need to look? We are finding that people, when they come into the office, are in many cases hoping to have more connections with others. And so we are looking at, you know, what we would do to change the space so that it's more connection oriented rather than just, you know, focus work oriented, which is the case historically at Microsoft. How are you all thinking about employees feeling left out in this new model? Our perspective on this is that first we offer flexibility and then second, 
that the rubber hits the road, the most important touch point that any employee will have with the company will be his or her manager. We just think that managers are so important in this experience going forward. For us, the culture makers, the culture shakers, those are the managers. That's where it really hits and where we see if people you know, are getting the experience we want them to have. And I understand Microsoft has something called the model coach care management philosophy. Could you explain that philosophy? You bet. What we really <laughs> expect from our managers is that they model the behavior that we want to see from employees. If we are really saying give flexibility to people, we want managers to be flexible. We don't want managers to show up in the office five days a week because employees feel a real pressure to show up then. In terms of coaching, we want them to not be directive and tell people exactly what to do, but instead to help people learn how to do things on their own. This just essentially gets to, you know, teaching a man to fish as opposed to just giving him fish. And then the third component has been so important during the pandemic and it's caring. We've really asked managers to lean in in a way that you don't often hear in a corporate environment. This idea of employee well-being clearly has popped as a trend that we think will be important for organizations going forward. Well, it's not only good for the employees and good for retention, it's also good for the bottom line to have happy and fulfilled workers. What companies are after, I think, is sustainable productivity. It's just like the difference between a sprint and a marathon. Like you've got to learn the pace and you can only be good over time if you have that sustainable differentiation competitively. And and you need to really, I think, cultivate that within your workforce to get it right. Okay, let's jump ahead. I know you don't like to predict the future, but let's assume it's October 4th and maybe, hopefully, folks have started returning to the office. So what excites you most about the possibility? You know, I might have an unlikely answer for you. What excites me most and I look forward to is this idea that it's a non-event, that what, Mm. what happens is that the news is that there isn't any news, that We just keep Hmm. on ticking on that people go into the office when it's right for them. People stay at home if they need to or if they want to. Really what ends up happening is we start to get that best of both worlds. We definitely know people want to be in the office. Again, we go back to the numbers and they show us that. But I just hope that that day starts to feel like, wow, what I really noticed was how well we just kept doing our jobs, even though people were scattered all over the planet. Flexibility is going to be good for everyone. You're optimistic that we'll be able to bridge the physical gap and create this better future of work together. What drives that sort of excitement? It's better for everyone. It's better for employees. You know, it is recognized Mm -hmm. that while the flexibility is valued, it's better for employers. Not only can they tap into new labor markets, new talent pools, but they also can have a sustainable competitive advantage because their people can keep going. You know, it feels like, yeah, I can keep performing at this level over time over the long term. What you'll start to see is, wow, the companies that are doing it are just performing better. Their people are happier and they become talent magnets in many ways. And so I think that we'll start to see, you know, the best practices spread quickly, even if it's lumpy at first and people figuring out how to do it, those things will very quickly be shared. Jared Spataro, who is the corporate vice president for Microsoft 365 and leader of Microsoft Teams. Jared, I so enjoyed getting to geek out with you over this. Likewise, Lise, thank you very much. You've been listening to the WorkLab podcast from Microsoft. There's a WorkLab digital publication too. Check out microsoft.com slash WorkLab for more insights about the future of work. And please rate, review, and follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. WorkLab is produced by Microsoft with Godfrey Dadich Partners and Reasonable Volume. I'm your host, Elise Hugh. Our correspondents are Mary Melton and Desmond Dickerson. Thanks for listening.